Over the last few thousand years, we have warped our own history. Our stories of the past have been changed, altered, mistranslated, and completely been misunderstood as we rounded the curve on the procession of the equinox. Modern views of our history account for many things, but completely dismiss many very important pieces in the puzzle. For example, the pyramids of Giza. There is no modern theory that accounts for how these could have been made. Individually, each block cannot be pulled even with 50 men pulling it, let alone drag it for hundreds of miles and then stack them on top of each other 450 feet in the air, in such a precise way that even modern technology can't achieve. Not to mention having it lined up precisely with both Orion's belt, a golden mean, and Fibonacci spiral, and be a primary nodal point of every sacred site on the planet. And that's just one example. Our history is not what we think. Many things that we've been led to believe to be true simply is not. This has got to be the biggest. The field of archeology span recently saw some monumental discoveries that are rocking the foundation of what we think we know about ourselves. Many ancient cities such as Babylon, Erech, and Akkad that were written about in the Bible and other ancient texts were always thought to be myths because no one could prove they existed. Then one of them was found. This led to finding another and then another. Inside one of these cities, archaeologists found thousands of cylindrical clay tablets hidden deep within the earth under this ancient city. The tablets were completely covered in text written in cuneiform and tell an ancient story that spans back over hundreds of thousands of years on this planet, describing the history of the earth and the origins of the human race in great detail. Now, the first thing we all want to do is just say that they were making things up. They didn't know the history of earth and they were simply creating tales to explain where they came from. However, if this was true, how can we explain how they knew so many things about the universe that would seem impossible to know? Not only did the Dogons know all about the distant planets in the solar system, but so did the Sumerians. They described them all in great detail in these Sumerian records. They also knew about the procession of the equinox. That's a tough one for a historian to understand, because it takes over 2,000 years of continuous observation to actually learn that the Earth has a wobble. The Sumerians had this information from day one of their civilization. A man named Zachariah Sitchin spent a long time transcribing these texts and had put them all together in his books, but many others have also done the same and the interpretations are always very similar. Not only that, but Thoth has also shared information about this with us and his account matches the Sumerian records. Adamus and other channelings discuss it as well. If you see all of these records and sources, there is a huge connection between the stories. Now, this story spans back hundreds of thousands of years into our past. It talks about Tiamat and Nibiru, the Nephilim, seeding the human race, Adam and Eve, and the children of Lemuria. This portion of the story is really interesting, but not the most crucial to know. We're not going to be covering this at this time. We are, however, going to be picking up the story at the end of Lemuria and discussing the events of Atlantis up to present day. What I'm going to tell you is a mix of what these records say along with what Thoth has told us for some finer details. Please have your own experience while watching this. I'm not going to tell you that this is fact. I am simply saying, decide for yourself. There was a time, long ago, when humans existed at a very high level of consciousness. We were interdimensional and were very psychic. We communicated through thought and emotion, much like how animals do rather than speaking or writing, which would seem very primitive. We lived primarily on a large string of islands called Lemuria, but there was a consciousness shift. We moved up in consciousness and the islands of Lumeria sank beneath the oceans. At the time of this shift, a new continent rose out of the waters. We called it Atlantis. Back in the early 1900s, the spiritual path of the United States was similar to what's happening today. People began to learn about meditation and study ancient lands like Atlantis and Lemuria. We actually found quite a bit of evidence that Lemuria existed and it had to do with coral. See, the ocean floor does rise and fall. Coral can exist up to 150 feet under the surface of the water. In 1910, the surface of the ocean was probably higher because they were able to see coral rings heading away from Easter Islands for a great distance. These rings were estimated to be found at 1800 feet, which means that for them to have existed, they would have had to be much higher and sunk slowly. Probably more important, they also found the exact same fauna and flora from the Hawaiian Islands all the way to the Easter Islands. This is a great distance, but if you look at a map, you'll see a long string. That string, according to Thoth, used to run along the western shores of Lemuria. It is only on these islands that have the same flora and fauna. Same trees, bugs, bacteria, everything. Science can only explain this if there were closer land bridges between these islands at one point. Although we were studying this at that time, World War I began soon after and we lost interest in spirituality and the ancient lands for a very long time. After the sinking of Lemuria and the rising of Atlantis, at first the human race became scattered. We moved to various islands and continents all over the world because we didn't have a home. Yet, we didn't know where to go. At that time, there were about 1,000 humans at a very high consciousness, more than all of the rest. They were called the Nikals. Today, we know them as ascended masters. 
The Nicals began preparing Atlantis to be our new home. They projected their energies across the surface of the continent in the form of the Tree of Life, not with 10 circles, but with 12, an extra on top on the island of Udal, and an extra on the bottom in the water. There were 10 components on the mainland, and even though it extended over hundreds of miles on the surface, it was projected to the accuracy of a single atom. We chose to move to Atlantis because of the Kundalini. In humans, the Kundalini is often referred to as the energy serpent that runs up and down your spine. When activated, it provides an immense amount of energy through all of the chakras. The Earth itself also has a Kundalini because the Earth is alive, like an organism, running from the center of the planet to a specific place on the surface. Wherever the Kundalini resides, the people there become the spiritual leaders of the world. The Earth chose Atlantis to be the new energetic center of the planet. After Atlantis, the Kundalini moved to the mountains of Tibet, which is why the Buddhists were the leaders in pure spirituality for the last 13,000 years. It was a very pure place. It moved again within the last 10 years, but that's a story for another time. If you want to read more, check out the book The Serpent of Light by Drunvalo Melchizedek. Suddenly, in a single day, the Nikals breathed life into the Tree of Life on the surface of Atlantis. This created vortexes of energy rotating out of each and every circle. Once the vortexes were established, the children of Lemuria began to be called forth. Millions upon millions of Lemurians who had settled all across the planet began to be pulled toward Atlantis. A great migration began. However, the Lemurian body of consciousness had only reached the age of 12 as a planetary consciousness. Because we were right-brained, we were a female species, like a 12-year-old girl, and some of our centers weren't working yet. They had worked with these energies, but only mastered eight of the 10. Each migrating Lemurian was attracted to one of these eight centers on Atlantis, depending on the nature of the individual. There, they settled and began to build cities. That left two vortexes with nobody using them, not a single person. These two vortexes were pulling life toward them, and in life, you can't have an empty place. Life will find a way to fill it. Similar to if you were driving along a freeway, following another car, and you drop too far behind, someone will fill the place. That's exactly what happened on Atlantis. Though the Lemurians had only filled eight of the vortex areas, Mayan records state clearly that there were 10 cities in Atlantis when it fell. You can see these records in the Troano document, which is now located in the British Museum. This document is estimated to be 3,500 years old, and it describes in detail the sinking of Atlantis. To fill these two empty vortexes, according to Thoth, two extraterrestrial races stepped in. Not one, but two completely different races. The first race were the Hebrews, coming from our future. Thoth says that they came from off planet, but we don't know where exactly. The Hebrews were kind of like a kid who went through fifth grade and didn't make it, so they had to do that grade over again. They learned all the math, the left brain stuff, but they didn't get the right brain aspect of evolving consciousness, the doing. They didn't graduate to the next level of evolution, so they had to do it again. They knew a lot of things that we didn't know yet and brought many concepts and ideas to us that we weren't aware of yet. Now, if this is true, this would explain quite a few things about the Hebrew people in general. They seem to have many sacred geometries hidden within their culture. It also puts perspective on the story of Exodus. Perhaps Moses incarnated into that lifetime to free the Hebrews because they were not direct descendants of humans and were being treated unfairly. Or could it be that Moses was visited by an ascended master of the Hebrews who guided him to free their people? Given what we know about dimensions and consciousness, it definitely puts a fresh perspective on old stories that didn't make much sense. We could talk about this more, but let's continue for now. There were no problems caused by the Hebrews coming to Atlantis. They actually benefited our evolution. The other race that stepped in caused big problems. These beings came from the nearby planet of Mars. See, according to Thoth, Mars looked very much like Earth a little less than a million years ago. It was beautiful. It had oceans and water and trees that were just fantastic. But something happened to them, and it has to do with something called the Lucifer Experiment. From the very beginning of creation, everything is simply an experiment. Creation itself was just consciousness creating and inhabiting itself in that creation. There is no divine plan. Spirit can do whatever it wants. Having said that, if spirit decides to cut itself off from the rest of consciousness and create a separate reality on its own, it can do that too. This is called the Lucifer experiment. Because spirit is God, it can do this. There is nothing wrong with that. We've kind of been led to believe that Lucifer is evil and the devil. This just isn't true. Lucifer is just another means of perceiving the reality. It is not a unity perception of oneness, but rather a duality perception of two-ness. There's a flower of life pattern for Lucifer as well, but that's a big topic for another time. Anytime the Lucifer experiment has been attempted in the universe, it always ends in failure. The species will cut itself off from love and will become incredibly male, left-brained. What always ends up happening is that everyone becomes very greedy. There is no compassion for one another and everyone ends up fighting until they end up killing themselves. More than a million years ago, the beings on Mars joined the Lucifer experiment and it failed dramatically. Basically, they cut themselves off from the unity of the universe and created a separate reality. When the Martians severed the love bond, they became pure male, logical beings with no emotions. What happened on Mars was that they ended up fighting. Mars became a battleground. Eventually, it became clear that Mars was not going to survive. They blew their atmosphere away and destroyed the surface of the planet. 
Nova recently did an episode on planetary magnetics, and they found some interesting things about Mars. The planet didn't have a magnetic system, however the surface was magnetized, implying that at one point it did, but that something happened. Now, we've been discussing the star tetrahedron before, and now I want to give you a brief understanding of the Merkava. The Merkaba was known in ancient times as the Chariot of Ascension. It is the star tetrahedral energy field around the body. All around the world, there are references to this in ancient texts. When activated to its full potential, the Merkaba, which is both a tool and part of your being, can be used to do the impossible, included but not limited to changing dimensions and traveling through the universe. Before Mars was destroyed, they built huge tetrahedral pyramids. They built three, four, and five-sided pyramids, eventually building a complex that was able to build a synthetic Merkaba. After a million years or so, it's been eroded, but the proof is there. Now, because the Martians were severed from the unity consciousness, they couldn't create a living Merkaba. They simply used it as a tool. They created a synthetic Merkaba to travel in time and find a new home. A small group of Martians tried to get away from Mars before it was destroyed, and that place they found was Earth about 65,000 years in our past. They saw this little vortex sitting there, just pulling in life with no one in it. They didn't ask permission. Being part of the Lucifer experiment, they just said, all right, let's do it. And they stepped onto that vortex, and in doing so, they joined and changed our evolutionary path. Thoth's father, Thom, was one of the Nikals who set up Atlantis on the island of Udal. That island, the top of the Tree of Life, was the brain of Atlantis, and on it was a small city called Poseidon. This city is what Plato was discussing when he said that Poseidon bore 10 children, the 10 circles on the Tree of Life. Poseidon was made of three rings painted in black, red, and white stones, and it was the symbol for Atlantis. The inner circle represented the Nikals. The middle circle were the priesthood, called the Maya, and the outer circle represented the regular people of Atlantis. We'll come back to this down the road. There were only a few thousand Martians who came to Earth through the synthetic Merkaba. The first thing they did when they arrived in Atlantis was try to take over the continent. They tried to declare war and invade. However, they were vulnerable due to their small numbers compared to the millions of Atlanteans, and we finally subdued them. We were able to stop them from conquering us, but we could not send them back. When this happened on our evolutionary path, we now had the planetary consciousness of a 14-year-old girl. The Martians were an incredibly male species and also very old. So what you had was a 14-year-old girl being taken over by a 60 or 70-year-old man. We had no choice in the matter. The Martians just stepped in and said, like it or not, we're here. They didn't care what we thought or felt about it. Really, it was no different from what the settlers of North America did to the Native Americans. Once the initial conflict was over, it was agreed that the Martians would try and understand this female thing they lacked, this emotional feeling, which they had none of at all. Things more or less settled for a while, but the Martians slowly began to implement their left brain technologies, which the Atlanteans knew nothing about. One after the other, the Martians kept putting out these left brain inventions until the Atlanteans slowly began to see things through their left brain. We slowly began to become a male species. The Martians gained control, bit by bit, until eventually they had all of the power, as was their intention. The animosity between Atlanteans and the Martians never subsided, not even till the end of Atlantis. They hated each other. The Atlanteans were shoved down and treated like inferiors. It was like a marriage that the female component didn't like, but the male component didn't really care if she liked it or not. It remained this way for a very long time, until about 26,000 years ago, when the next phase slowly began. Before we continue, we have to talk about polar shifts. See, in the 1930s, Edgar Cayce was channeling information for a geologist when he stopped and he said, there's something you should know. In the near future, the Earth's poles are going to shift. Cayce was a brilliant man with a very strong connection to higher dimensions, where he communicated with other beings for the human race. Ultimately, it was because of his channelings that the belief system called New Age was created. This is again just putting what he was doing into boxes of understanding, because no one else understood what he was doing at that time. Nevertheless, when Cayce talked, people listened. Geologists began exploring the possibility of a polar shift, and they found something remarkable. A string of major pieces of evidence came forth and lent tremendous weight to what Casey was saying, and they have now changed the world's view on the subject. Scientists believed that if there was going to be a physical pole shift, there would also be a change in the magnetic poles. Through studying lava beds, geologists were able to see where the planetary magnetics were when the lava beds hardened at certain depths. They found that the earlier magnetic poles were not where they were now, but in Hawaii. The last shift that took place was 13,000 years ago, and we will get there in the story soon. They did another test and found that it had shifted again 26,000 years ago as well. Scientists also learned that polar shifts happen very quickly. In a single day, the magnetics would do a complete flip, or turn 90 degrees. There's that number again. And within 24 hours, the sun would be rising differently than it did the previous day. This shift has happened hundreds of times over the last 100 million years on Earth, but it's speeding up now and happening faster and faster. Now only 13,000 years between each shift. A whole new viewpoint is beginning to be understood. From space, would this not appear as a pulse? 
Now, there's a lot more to talk about with polar shifts, but I'm going to give you the basics. A scientist named Charles Hapgood was studying this at great detail because the leading theory behind what caused polar shifts was still underdeveloped at the time. He came up with a theory that demonstrated to be possible through various experiments. Through these experiments, they learned that the surface of the Earth, the crust, could slip over the main mass of the Earth, which continues its rotation as if nothing happened. The crust would rotate and spin out of control until eventually it settles again in a new location aligned with the new magnetics. During this time, there are massive earthquakes and tsunamis and devastations that rock the world. Doesn't that sound a bit like the destruction described in the Book of Revelations? Now, I don't want to freak anyone out. Besides Edgar Cayce's account, many other ancient prophecies, including Nostradamus and Mayan prophecies, have talked about polar shifts in one way or another. And modern science is becoming increasingly aware that there is going to be a polar shift in our near future, which is lining up with our consciousness shift, though they don't take that aspect into account. It's funny, actually. A while back, NOVA did two reports on polar shifts, and both times, NASA shut them down. Then recently, NOVA released a new video called Earth's Magnetic Storm. That video shows all of the evidence for pole shifts without actually using the words pole shift. It's almost as if a specific company doesn't want us knowing about this and the evidence that's been brought forth. Polar shifts are directly related to the magnetics of the planet as well. Planetary magnetics are supposed to look like this, but the reality is much different. Our magnetics have been weakening over the last 500 years or so, and today, they look a little more like this. It was the magnetics becoming more and more warped that's causing many of the problems we've seen in the last 20 years. Birds follow the magnetics of the planet to migrate, and they'd be ending up in places they shouldn't be. Whales were continually beaching themselves in the 90s because they followed these magnetics, which led them to land where there should have been water. As for humans, you know how on the night of the full moon there are more rapes, murders, and violent crimes than any other night of the lunar cycle? Well, the moon affects the magnetics of the Earth, slightly. But the magnetics are so warped right now, it's affecting how we think and act as a planet. Our collapse of social structure is related to the geomagnetics of the Earth. Or perhaps it's the other way around. There's one other thing that we need to discuss about polar shifts. They always line up with a consciousness shift. They are interrelated. Thoth lived on Atlantis for a very long time, and he told us that he saw the Earth shift five times, watching the sun rise in the east, and then the west, then the east, then the west. This is how to explain why during a consciousness shift at the end of Lemuria, it sank beneath the oceans and Atlantis rose. If the crust was spinning randomly around the planet, many geological events such as continents rising and falling would take place. Now that we have an understanding of polar shifts, we can continue with this drama on Atlantis. 26,000 years ago, we were exactly where we were today on the procession of the equinox. We had gone through our falling asleep phase and we were about to begin waking up. It was at this point that there was a small consciousness shift. We actually went down in consciousness, not up. A piece of Atlantis about the size of Rhode Island sank into the ocean. This caused a tremendous amount of fear within the Atlanteans because they thought they were going to lose the whole continent, like what happened with Lemuria. Because of the consciousness shift, one of the bigger things they lost was their connection to the future. They couldn't foresee big events such as the potential sinking of their home. After about 200 years, this fear began to subside. Now in both the Bible and the Sumerian records, the accounts of Adam, Eve, and all of their children were recorded to have exceptionally long lifespans, like 900 years or so. So 200 years for us back then is like 20 years for us today. We'll explain how we got there soon. Things kind of settled for a while, and then between 13,000 and 16,000 years ago, a comet approached the Earth. Because we were living at a high consciousness across all dimensions, the Atlanteans became aware of it before it hit. A great conflict occurred in Atlantis. The Martians, who were in the minority, even though they were in control, wanted to blow it out of the sky with their laser technology. However, the Nikals had learned of the comet's true nature, and the Atlanteans protested. They said that the comet was in divine order. They had to allow it to take place naturally. Let it hit the Earth. That's what's supposed to happen. The Martians fought the Atlanteans, but in the end, they gave in. The Martians agreed to let it hit the Earth. When the time arrived, it came screaming into the atmosphere, plunging into the Atlantic Ocean, just off to the western shores of Atlantis, near where Charleston, South Carolina is now. Only that was at the bottom of the ocean at the time. The remnants of the comet are now scattered across four states, and science has definitely determined that it hit at least 12,000 years ago, if not more. They're still finding pieces today. Although the main portion struck near Charleston, a few fragments actually hit the main body of Atlantis, crashing into an area right where the Martians were living, killing a huge portion of their population. They were pissed. They said, it's all over, we're divorcing you, and we're gonna do whatever we want. You can do what you want, but we will never listen to you again. We know this whole bit. We've seen it in divorced families throughout the world. And the children? Well, look at our modern world today. We are the children. You can guess what the Martians did next. Their primary interface with the reality was control, and when their anger rose to meet their desire for control, they decided to take over the Earth. 
They began to once again create a complex like the one they built on Mars long ago to try and create another synthetic Merkaba. If they had succeeded, they would have gained control over everything on the planet. The only thing was, around 50,000 Earth years had passed since they had built a Merkaba and they didn't quite remember how to do it. But they thought they did. The Martians built the buildings in Atlantis. They set up the whole experiment, threw the switch, and lost control. The destruction was immense. In this reality, you can hardly make a greater error than to create an out of control Merkaba. The experiment began to rip open the dimensional levels, not the higher ones, but the lower ones. To give an analogy, if you took a knife and slit open your stomach, the stomach acids would seep into other parts of the body that it's not supposed to be in. That's like ripping open the dimensions. The Martians almost destroyed the earth. The environmental disaster we are experiencing today is nothing in comparison, though today's disasters are a direct result of these events. Because of this tear in the dimensional levels, a huge number of lower dimensional spirits and beings were thrown out of their comfort zone and into these higher levels. They were forced into a world that they did not know or understand. To survive, they needed bodies and began automatically entering into the bodies of people. For every human body, there were hundreds of lower dimensional spirits inhabiting them. These beings were earthlings like us, but very different, not coming from this dimension. It was a catastrophe, probably the biggest the earth has ever seen. The reason the Nikals were special wasn't just because of their incredibly high consciousness, making them like guides of Atlantis. They also had achieved what today we call immortality. Let's just say they figured out a way to keep their body healthy and young for as long as they chose and could choose to pass on whenever they desired it. When reincarnating, they do not suffer the great memory loss that we do when we incarnate. They did it through their expanded consciousness and tantric interdimensional sex meditations. This is how Thoth was a priest king of Atlantis for thousands of years and stayed on earth until 15 years ago when he gave all of his memories and understanding about sacred geometry to a man named Drunvalo Melchizedek. The Merkaba is formed out of three star tetrahedrons overlaid on top of each other. Two of them are counter-rotating and the third is stationary. When the Merkaba is formed with the unity consciousness, it is formed internally with love. When it is formed externally through the Lucifer experiment, it does not have that love and can become unstable very quickly. The Martians' attempt at controlling the world took place on one of the small islands in the west of Atlantis. This place today is known as the Bermuda Triangle. It's a triangle because the top of the stationary tetrahedron of the Merkaba is actually sticking out of the water there, which causes a huge electromagnetic imbalance in that area. Many planes and boats have reported to have gone missing there. They just vanish without a trace. The imbalance is multidimensional, and in many cases, these ships and planes have been sucked into different dimensions, never to be seen again. That Merkaba is still there on the sea floor today, but from what I know, it's going to be corrected soon. The Nikals did their best to save Atlantis. They sent most of the lower dimensional beings back, at least as many as they could, and sealed up the dimensional tear. Despite this, the situation got really bad, really fast. All of the economic systems collapsed. Financial, social, and all concepts of how life ought to be completely broke down. Everyone on Atlantis began getting sick with weird diseases and the entire continent went into a state of survival. Life was no longer about living. It became about surviving until tomorrow. It was a literal hell on earth. The Nikals had no idea what to do. They were children compared to the events that had been thrust upon them. So they prayed. They prayed to the highest levels of conscious life in the universe, asking for help from anyone who could hear them. The problem was reviewed on many high levels of life, who I am drawing as the Justice League because the 11th and 12th dimensions are completely incomprehensible to us in our current state. What they told us was this, we were going to fall. We were going to hit rock bottom, level one, the lowest place we possibly could be in the universe and still survive. Also, we were changing polarity, we were no longer a female species, so we were starting from square one as a male species. And finally, and this was the shocker, we would only have 13,000 years to return to Christ consciousness. Normally, it takes hundreds of thousands of years for a species to get to Christ consciousness. We had to do it in a fraction of the time. If we didn't, we would not survive. This has never happened before in the universe, ever. Thoth, who was the priest king of Atlantis at the time, learned that they would have to perform this experiment on themselves. They received instructions from the highest levels of life and they went on their way. Thoth proceeded with a being named Ra and Aragat who were previous kings of Atlantis and began the experiment. To understand what they did, we have to talk about consciousness grids. A planetary grid is an etheric crystalline structure that envelops the planet and holds the consciousness of any one species of life. This grid does have an electromagnetic component associated with the third dimension, but it also has a component for every dimension as well. These grids are geometric, of course, and science will eventually discover that there is a grid for every species in the world. Each of these grids have their own geometry and are unique. There's not another one like it, just as the species itself are unique. These grids give off light as well, and from space they can be seen as the source of the bluish glow around the Earth. What Thoth and friends had to do was create a synthetic Christ consciousness grid, allowing humans to ascend to the Christ consciousness in a very short time. But first, let's talk about the science behind the grid. 
Perhaps you've heard of the 100th monkey experiment. Over a span of 30 years, scientists were researching a species of monkey called Makaka fuscata on an island in Japan. They were providing the monkeys with sweet potatoes by dropping them in the sand. The monkeys liked sweet potatoes, but they didn't like the sand and dirt so much. A few monkey children figured out that they could wash their sweet potatoes, and some of them taught the technique to their parents. Only a few of the adult monkeys did this though. This went on for some time until one day, the monkeys who actually knew the technique hit critical mass and bingo. The technique started spreading faster than it did before. Monkeys started learning it really easily across all of the Japanese islands nearby, as well as on the mainland. They knew that there had to be something that wasn't yet understood about how a species is connected to itself. So what did we do? We tried it on humans. A research team made a picture out of human faces, about a hundred faces hidden within a single picture. But at first glance, you could only see about six or seven. They did several surveys with a few hundred people in Australia and said, all right, find the faces. Most people could only pick out six, seven, eight, nine or so, not many more. After that, the research team went to Britain and aired the picture on a closed cable BBC special that was shown only in England. They showed where all of the faces were, every last one. Half of the research team, which stayed in Australia, did the experiment again with new subjects. And lo and behold, people were just naturally able to see more faces. After this experiment, they knew that something definitely connects us all and the field of noetics is learning more about it daily. It's mass consciousness. In lesson 11, I showed you the three levels of consciousness. Each of these levels have their own consciousness grids around the planet. And our second level grid is based on squares and triangles. Many governments of the world, especially the Russian and US governments, were studying our grids back in the 60s and probably earlier. When mapping out the grid on the planet, you find little military bases on many of the nodal points of the grid. There are tons of these bases way out in the middle of nowhere, like on little islands like Guam. This couldn't be a coincidence that these government powers place their bases right where the little spirals came out of the grid. They were trying to take control of the grid because if you control consciousness, you control what we think and feel. Of course, there was another organization that had its hand in both of these governments and still do, and we will discuss them soon enough. This grid is visible through astral projection as well. 13,000 years ago, it began. Thoth, Ra, and Aragat were to create a global complex that was able to build a synthetic Christ consciousness grid over a 13,000 year time period. The first thing they did was to fly to a place which is now called the Giza Plateau, but back then it was known as the land of Chem. It was also a rainforest back then as well, not desert like it is today. First, they created a grid around the planet fourth dimensionally and then began to construct it in the physical third dimension. They went to the male energetic axis of the earth and constructed a complex which today is called the solar cross. These men were six dimensional beings at that time and were living at a very high level of consciousness. So whatever they thought happened instantly. It was that simple. According to Thoth, he built the Great Pyramid, not the Egyptian King Cheops. Thoth says that it was built 200 years prior to the pole shift and built very quickly. These pyramids were aligned precisely with both Fibonacci and golden mean spirals emanating from out of the solar cross. Interestingly enough, Edgar Cayce also channeled that the pyramids were constructed in this time. The pyramids were also found to be built from the top down. The stones on top were placed first, which has baffled researchers ever since. Every time more is learned about the pyramids, we move further into dark on understanding how they were formed. If what Thoth says is true, well, that explains everything. From there, Thoth and friends constructed an entire network of temples and structures along this grid fourth dimensionally, placing them on nodes on the new synthetic Christ consciousness grid they were creating. All of them were made with Fibonacci or golden mean spirals, and all of them were mathematically referred back to the solar cross in Egypt through the Great Pyramid. The creation of all of the sacred sites on the planet were no accident. It was a single consciousness that created them all, from Machu Picchu to Stonehenge to Zaghuan, you name it. There are a few exceptions, but most were created by a single awareness as part of a unity consciousness grid. Although the Great Pyramid was done all at once, many of these ancient structures of the world were made fourth dimensionally and slowly dropped in frequency until they manifested on the third dimension over a long period of time. Richard Hoagland's research brings this forward, but he wasn't the first either. They showed how one sacred site is extrapolated from another to another to another. A hot topic of discussion right now are ley lines. These are simply geometric relations between sacred sites. Archaeologists are now finding these huge connections between major spiritual sites in the globe, and now we know why they're connected. These sites had to be built physically so that the Christ consciousness grid could manifest. In a way, think of the physical sites as the wiring of a giant wireless electrical system, and then it needs about 13,000 years of continuous energy flow for it to actually turn on. And just so that you're not left in suspense, yes, the grid was completed. It came to life and is now active, though not really used. Congratulations, Earth. We actually survived. Not only has Thoth told us this in person, but he's also written it down in the Emerald Tablets. These tablets were left in the Great Pyramid thousands of years ago. There are 12 tablets in total, formed from a substance created through alchemical transmutation. They are imperishable, resistant to all elements and corrosion. Their atomic structure is fixed in place and no change can ever take place. In that respect, they violate the material laws of ionization. 
These tablets share a great wisdom and you can read them at over a hundred different levels of consciousness and you will always understand them differently. If you're interested in this stuff, you should definitely consider reading them. As you can probably tell, Thoth plays a pretty large role in what happened. Most of this information comes from him. Thoth also provided most of this information about the flower of life and its geometric relationship to consciousness with us. And this stuff is tied intimately to the geometry of the universe. Considering the quality and quantity of information that he has shared, it makes you really start considering that this next part can be true. The Great Pyramid has a legendary missing capstone. According to the Emerald Tablets, deep under the Great Pyramid, there's a room called the Hall of Records. This room was not built by Thoth and long predates the Atlantean civilization. Within the Hall of Records is the capstone of the pyramid, which is five and a half inches high, solid gold and completely holographic image of the Great Pyramid. It has all of the little rooms and everything. However, this leaves us with a 24 square foot piece of the Great Pyramid that's missing. If what Thoth says is true, that missing piece actually belongs to a very special airship that exists on Earth. And the way to the airship is through the Sphinx. The Sphinx, according to Thoth, is not 12,000 years old, but dates back over five and a half million years on Earth. Deep under the Sphinx, about one mile down, is a round room with a flat floor and flat ceiling. Inside this room is the oldest synthetic object on Earth. The object is about two city blocks in size. It's round like a disc and has a flat bottom and top. It is also only about three atoms thick, except for a pattern on the top and bottom which looks like this. This pattern is five atoms thick. Thoth says that it's powered by consciousness, thoughts, and feelings, and connects with your own living Merkaba, which means that it becomes an extension of you and your own energy fields. The ship is also intimately connected with the spirit of the Earth, and is the protector for the whole planet. Thoth built the pyramid the way he did to fit with the ship. When on top of the Great Pyramid, it creates this image from above. The disk ship has a circumference equal to the perimeter of the Great Pyramid. As we discussed in Lesson 11, whenever that ratio appears, life occurs. This ship can only be used by the purest of souls. See, whenever we approach the point in the procession of the equinox where our poles do these shifts, we become very vulnerable. Things often degenerate, and while things become chaotic, there are often other species who wish to take us over. This has always happened, not just with us, but with all evolving consciousness. Every time a takeover seems imminent, a very pure person will find their way to the ship and raise it into the air. The earth and sun will connect with that person and give him or her great power. Then whatever that person thinks and feels will happen. And think about it, if consciousness is the primary core component of the entire planet, does it not make sense that it would have its own defense mechanism? This defense is an airship that plugs into the earth and the sun, allowing the earth to have protection. Our takeover event actually already happened, the same year the Christ grid was activated. The year was 1989, and we were having some troubles with the Greys, a race of ETs who were slowly plotting takeover due to a previous scuffle we were having. A very pure woman in Peru made the ascension process into the Christ consciousness grid and found the ship. She tuned it to the frequency of the fourth dimension where she raised it through the earth and into the air and manifested a situation for the greys to leave. Within a very short time, the greys began getting sick and remained sick for as long as they stayed here. They have been forced to leave for now and we are once again safe. The ship is a warship in that whatever race is trying to take over, the person will just think them away, think up a situation and force them to leave. Returning to the events on Atlantis, after completing the complex in Egypt, Thoth and pals returned to Atlantis where they waited for about 200 years until that critical point on the procession of the equinox where the poles would shift. They knew that Atlantis would sink and they would be ready. Previously on Thoth and pals. Thoth, the poles are shifting. Oh, the poles shift? Yeah, whoa, what's wrong with your eyes? I don't know. When Thoth first saw signs of the polar shift, they returned to the land of Chem and raised the warship into the sky. They went to Atlantis and picked up the Nikals. The Nikals weren't just passengers though, and each and every being was working in unity to create a very powerful Merkaba around themselves and the ship. They returned to the Great Pyramid and landed the ship on top, forming the Phi Ratio with the Pyramid. And then, it happened. The poles began to shift, and human consciousness began to plummet. Simultaneously, the electromagnetic and magnetic fields of the Earth collapsed, and all life on the planet went into the Great Void, the three and a half days of absolute blackness described by many ancient cultures in the world. The Emerald Tablets say that whenever we go through a polar shift, we go through a void space as we change our frequencies for about three and a half days. This is also in the Troano document depicted by three and a half stones painted black. This refers to a time when we go through what science calls the electromagnetic null zone. During the pole shift, a phenomenon takes place where everything just seems to disappear for a certain time. Usually it's between two to four days, and the last time it was three and a half days. Here's where it gets interesting. What happens to us does not usually happen to a normal species, because most advanced species will have their Merkabas handy at the time of the shift. We didn't, due to our little crisis, and we got sucked into the void space without protection. This resulted in us losing our memories. Science realizes that all of our memories are connected through cells in our brains as well as fields around our heads. 
What is not entirely understood by science yet, at least not directly, is the connection our memories have with the planet itself. We've discussed this before. The magnetics of the Earth affect how we think and act. The Merkaba is an electromagnetic field that you create around your body that can serve as protection from void as you're consciously going through it. What happened to us when we didn't have that protection? It was a clean wipe. When we existed on Atlantis, we were living at a very high level of consciousness in a higher dimension. We had extremely advanced and sophisticated bodies and minds and were capable of practically anything, living in a dimension where molecules were spaced so far apart that consciousness could interact with them without physically moving. It's hard to explain because you can literally shape your environment immediately through your consciousness in these higher frequencies. In that sense, we were creators, knowing and understanding oneness, beings of love. But then we fell. We dropped back down to this place called the third dimension. We also fell in consciousness back to zero. We forgot how to use the pineal gland and it slowly shrunk to the size it is now, like a raisin, where it's supposed to be eyeball size. When this happened, we forgot how to breathe source energy into our bodies and our lifespans went kaput. Eventually, we went from 900 years to what it is today. We had not experienced this dense reality that we had before, at least for a very long time. We were kind of like a supercomputer that gets completely wiped, no operating system or anything. We had these advanced physical bodies, but we didn't know how to use them. This is why today we are so physically advanced compared to pretty much all the other animals in this third dimension. For a time, the survivors of the Atlantean fall, and there were a few, were literally hairy barbarians. We even had to rediscover fire. The reason we're having such a hard time finding evidence of Atlantis is because for the most part, the events of Atlantis took place on a much higher dimension than our physical earth exists on right now. Everything I've drawn of Atlantis can't be taken as that's what it looked like because it didn't. This landmass did physically exist, but the Atlanteans were not inhabiting that dimension of its existence. If the warship hadn't been protected by the Merkaba, the Nikals would have lost their memories. They retained their memories when the earth came out of the void and began their work once more. Thoth and one third of the Nikals went to the Island of the Sun in Bolivia. Aragot and one third went to Tibet and Ra and the remaining third went to Egypt where they waited. Now we're going to begin bridging the gaps between this story and our current history. In between the fall of Atlantis and the dawn of our first civilizations, who were the Egyptians and the Sumerians, there was a 6,500 year gap between them. What was happening to us in that time? We have to look at this procession chart again. This is where we fell in consciousness, point C, and this was our falling asleep phase too. Thoth, Ra, and the Ascended Masters were waiting until point D. They had to wait for humans to just evolve themselves over a 6,500 year time period until they were advanced enough to actually receive this new information that they were going to provide. Sometime in here was when the flood of Noah occurred. Because of the pole shift, the earth went through an ice age. This is scientific fact. When the ice melted, it would have caused massive flooding. DNA is the physical manifestation of who you are. It is your soul's physical aspect. What we are seeing in DNA is changes in the codons. There are 64 possible codons in DNA and humans only have about 22 or so. What we're finding is that there are six more codons being activated within these children and they are choosing two of the six. These kids are what we call indigo and crystal children and probably the super psychics as well. Now, this is a chromosome. Basically, what this is, is lots and lots of DNA wrapped into this weird H-like shape. This is located in every cell and is part of your body of consciousness. What Thoth tells us is that every level of consciousness seen here not only has its own consciousness grid, but its chromosome change as well. The second level, where we are now, has 44 and 2 chromosomes. To any scientist, this is basic biology. The first level, however, has 42 and 2, and this third level has 46 and 2. The fourth and fifth have 48 and 2 and 50 and 2, respectively. The primary physically visible difference between these DNA in all life is height. The first level has an average height of 4 to 6 feet tall. The second level, us, has an average height of 5 to 7 feet. Third are about 10 to 16 feet, which we are about to translate to. Fourth is 30 to 35 feet, and the last is 50 to 60. You may remember a being named Metatron, the Hebrew archangel who is the perfection of what humanity is to become. He was 55 feet tall, that guy. The last two heights are far in the distant future for us though. This is a place in Egypt today called Abu Simbel. The first thing you notice is that these statues are huge, but with the information about the DNA, this paints a different picture. These beings would be in the 60 foot range if they were to stand. They were at the fifth level of consciousness. These beings on a different wall are 35 feet tall, fourth level of consciousness. Here are some third levels as well. Archaeologists saw this and thought that it meant that the man was just much more important than the woman, when in actuality, the kings of Egypt had five different names, one for every level of consciousness. Some of the kings were even able to translate into different dimensions, and that's how they guided the population with the power of the gods. In Egypt, according to today's top archaeologists and researchers, the Egyptians and Sumerians both began their civilizations right around the same time from each other, within a few hundred years or so. Both of these civilizations emerged out of nowhere with perfect writing abilities that were not improved upon since. 
When they first emerged, they were extremely sophisticated and clear and slowly degenerated over generations. No archeologist can explain how this happened or explain how it could have happened. They placed Egypt and Sumer into a special classification called stair-step evolution. What happened was one day Egypt got its language full and complete. Then the knowledge leveled off and then it got another massive leap a little while later. Then suddenly they knew everything about water and moat systems, just perfect. Then a little time later, bam, they're masters of hydraulics. How did Egypt and Sumer do this? Well, this is what Thoth said. When we were evolving on our own for 6,500 years, Ra and the ascended masters were waiting in an underground city beneath the Great Pyramid. We'll come back to this in a bit. Thoth's son Tat formed a group called the Tat Brotherhood, which is a secret group that still exists today as protectors and keepers of the sacred temples. Today, they're still connected to the ascended masters. So about 6,000 years ago, some members of the Tat Brotherhood would wait until they would meet someone who could understand what they were going to teach them. When they found someone, they would just tune their frequencies to the third dimension and walk up and tell them information flat out. They said, hey, if you do this and this, this happens. The Egyptians would say, wow, look at that. Then they would go underground, wait another little while and repeat the process. Over a short period of time, the Egyptian and Sumerian evolution shot up in stair steps. As for the Sumerians, they also received a more detailed story by those who were assisting them. They described to the Sumerians in all of the details they remembered. They said, this is the history of the planet, write it down. The Sumerians knew about the procession of the equinox because they were told it by the Nicals from Atlantis. After this stair step period, we began to fall asleep further. Things got worse once more. It was our falling sleep stage of procession. And although the Nicals had given us a boost, we were consciously dozing off. On that note, it's time for the story about the city under the pyramid. Keep an open mind about this because there is very little proof for what I'm about to say. For over 40 years, Drunvalo Melchizedek has been studying human consciousness through sacred geometry and spiritual teachers and masters all over the world. In 1996, he was contacted by a source in Egypt who said that something incredible had been discovered. A stone stele came out of the ground between the paws of the Sphinx into the daylight. They removed it and dug into the earth beneath the Sphinx. There they found a room with three tunnels leading off of it. One of the tunnels, which went to the Great Pyramid, had another tunnel coming off it, and it was shielded by a wall of light. Bullets could not pass through this field and people could not even get close to it without feeling like they're going to die. The Egyptian government found a particular person who could turn off this field. They also had brought in Paramount Studios to film it as they had filmed the opening of King Tut's tomb. They had a good relationship with Egypt. The government wanted several million dollars from Paramount, but at the last minute, they asked for an extra one and a half million under the table. Paramount was outraged and they backed off. Things were silent for about three months. Then Drunvalo heard from a source again, who was involved in all this, who said that three men shut off the light field and went inside. They found themselves inside a very large building that went on for miles underground, which was really the edge of a giant underground city, which was really just one giant building. Then a little while later, an Egyptian archeologist named Larry Hunter began describing the same thing, but more detailed. He said that the city was six and a half by eight miles wide and 12 stories deep. And the city was outlined by specific temples in Egypt. The three pyramids are lined up with Orion's belt, but there are also small temples for every other star in the constellation. Those temples map out the city underground and are made out of a special stone not found anywhere else in Egypt called Koinon stone. Incredibly enough, very recently, ancient tunnels were found in Romania that led to both Egypt and the inner earth. Now, I don't have time to go into detail about this particular story, but if you want, check out the book Transylvanian Sunrise by Radu Sinemar. To be clear, this is a theory that has not been accepted by the Egyptian government, but the underground city that Thoth said was there is, according to Mr. Hunter, marked by temples made of a unique substance and the temples match the star pattern of the constellation of Orion. 4,000 years after the stair-step evolution, we were at our lowest stage of our evolution. We were hitting bottom on the awareness road. Suddenly, out of the darkness, three men came to earth to give us a little nudge. Everything in ancient Egypt was synthetic. They had this entire civilization based around achieving heightened states of consciousness, but they had to do it through tools. Now, we're not gonna look at each of these tools individually, but let me give you a brief overview here. This tool was used for transferring vibrations into the body. Along with that were the hook and flail. This little device was a kind of generator to increase vibrations, though there's not too much information available on it. This thing, however, was their most important tool, the Ankh. They saw the Ankh as the secret to eternal life and they used it not as a physical tool, but as an energetic one. They would use this form and onk their sexual energy. Now, this could be a huge topic on its own, like how energy travels up and down the body through a vertical tube between five energy channels that counter rotate as they extend through the body. But basically, sexual energy is an incredibly powerful energy. We definitely abuse it today, but what the Egyptians knew was that when you had an orgasm, a very large amount of energy bursts from your root chakra all the way up your spine to the top of your head, and then it gets released. 
What the Egyptians would do was when the spiral of energy hit their heart chakra, they would onk the energy out of the back of their body and over their head and back into their body, where they would keep the energy and retain a massive energy boost. In other words, if you take a tuning fork and hit it, it will reverberate for a certain amount of time. Then, if you attach an onk on top of it and hit it again, it will reverberate at least three times longer. The Egyptians were doing this with their bodies. Moving on, when Atlantis was first formed, the Nikal set up something called a mystery school. This is a special type of school where you learn about consciousness, and you learn different aspects of expanding your own consciousness, and eventually getting to a place where you become immortal. It usually took a very long time to achieve this state, and that's why there were only about 1,000 Akals in comparison to the millions of Lemurians at the start of Atlantis. The first Atlantean to reach the immortal state was a man named Osiris. Ancient Egypt's mythology tells a story about Osiris, a man who was killed and cut up into pieces by his brother in an act of rage, and then the pieces were scattered. This event, perhaps less exaggerated than the myths, actually did happen, and it took place on Atlantis. Osiris' wife and sister retrieved the pieces, and upon returning the final piece, they restored the creative energy flow and brought his spirit back into the body. Through doing this, Osiris became immortal, and he was the first immortal of Atlantis. This story is told throughout ancient Egypt on many temple walls, and I'm going to show you why. Osiris went through the three stages of consciousness. The first one was whole, the second was separated from itself, included physically, and the third was whole again. The Nikals used Osiris' understanding of how he became immortal as a template for how others could do it as well, only through consciousness, without needing to be cut up, of course. This eventually became what we would call the religion of Atlantis, but it was more of a deeper understanding that they were following. This template was also used in Egypt, which we will look at now. Through this stair-step evolution, we began to change from the first level of consciousness into the second. Before the fall, we had incredible memories. It wasn't this vague recollection that we have now, but today we might see it as full tilt 3D holographic memory. After the fall, we still had a photographic memory and could share these experiences with each other, which is called dream time. It is what the Aborigines of Australia still have today. Through the introduction of writing, however, we began to change from the first level of consciousness into the second. We lost our incredible memories and became very separate from each other and ourselves. Thoth was the one who introduced writing, and if you look at ancient Egyptian culture, it even says, Thoth brought writing to us, as well as many other things. Now that we were in the second level, over time, things began to change, and a very serious problem developed, which if it hadn't been solved, it would have caused a major catastrophe in our own near future. Basically, in Egypt, the Ascended Masters had used Osiris' genetic coding of changing chromosomes to show others the path of ascension. They developed a system of 42 and 2 gods, with a lowercase g, they were actually called Neaters. Most will recognize this one. His name was Anubis. There were 42 and 2 Neaters who were representative of human chromosomes. Each one of them showed a specific pathway of life or human experience, and people would follow these understandings to learn more about their life or their own reality. The problem developed when both Upper Egypt and Lower Egypt became more separated from themselves, and the meanings of these Neaters were lost. Over time, the drawings of these Neaters changed, and the meanings changed with them. People had no idea what they meant. Then it got worse, when the Egyptian king Menes merged Upper Egypt and Lower Egypt into a unified country. Menes also merged the belief systems, so now you had 88 gods that people were fighting over to decide who was really god. This was an issue, because now they had people not knowing what to believe, completely lost, separated from their understanding of their own divinity and god. Things became separated further, people fought over which gods were really gods. Today, we look back and say, wow, <laughs> they thought there were so many gods, when really, this wasn't the case at all. Even with the help from the Tat Brotherhood, we just couldn't get it right. There was one short period of Egyptian culture that most historians don't really understand. As it's written in ancient texts and hieroglyphs, for 17 and a half years, there was a bizarre new ruler that completely changed how Egypt was run. And his name was Akhenaten. Before him, there were only kings. Akhenaten was the first pharaoh, which meant that which you will become. He was also, believe it or not, 15 to 16 feet tall, at least that's how he was always depicted, and had an elongated skull. Both of these aspects are related to Christ consciousness. Akhenaten abolished all previous understandings of God and tried to instill a one God understanding in everyone. After 17 years, the majority of Egyptians revolted and Akhenaten was killed, soon to be replaced by someone else, returning to the old system. What actually happened? To correct the problem, Thoth got the help from I and Tia, who were the first immortals from Lemuria, and got them to mate interdimensionally to conceive a Christ consciousness being. Thoth said that he worked with the previous kings of Egypt to help achieve this, and Egyptologists find that Akhenaten came completely out of nowhere. It took some time, and there was a transitional period involving Amenhotep III, but soon Akhenaten was on the throne. Akhenaten used his time to bring Egypt back to a simple religion where there was one god, one reality. 
He used imagery of a sun disk to represent this. The priests in Egypt didn't like that because the religious beliefs were centered on the priests. Then he comes along and says, you don't need priests, God is within you, and you can access God from within your own selves. Well, they didn't like that. He also pulled the military back and said, don't attack unless someone else attacks first. The military didn't like him either. Plus, the people generally didn't like him because they enjoyed worshiping their many gods. Eventually, they disposed of him. After all that, what did Akhenaten do that evidently saved humankind? Well, he developed the mystery school with the intention of showing a small group of humans a way to ascend into the immortal state. Usually, it took hundreds of years to reach the level of immortality and Akhenaten had 17 years to produce results. This was a very close call, but he did it. He actually showed 300 individuals the path to immortality in this short time. So after the general population disposed of Akhenaten, these 300 immortals would go beyond Egypt. Thoth wrote in the Emerald Tablets that after ancient Egypt ended, he brought a man named Pythagoras into the Great Pyramid and taught him the geometry of the universe. That man then went on to found Greece, which was originally built upon schools for teaching geometry and the platonic solids and all of that stuff. Thoth lived a lifetime here as well, where he was known as Hermes Trismegustus. Akhenaten's immortals became a group called the Essene Brotherhood. They first migrated to a place called Masada in Israel. Even today, Masada is known as the capital of the Essene Brotherhood. Now get this. In this brotherhood, there were two people in particular, a man and a woman. You might have heard of them. Mary and Joseph? See, it was part of the Ascended Master's plan that they would bring in a being who would show the pathway to Christ consciousness. He would come to Earth as a second level being, a regular Joe, and achieve Christ consciousness through the course of his life. Then, the ascension process, the transitional experience from the second to third level, would go into the consciousness grid that was still being formed. He was able to transition because he was originally from these higher levels. That man is known today as Jesus, although his name at that time was Yahshua ben Hur. If Yahshua had not shown up, we would not have had that ascension experience available to us today. None of us would be aware that these higher levels of understanding even existed and we would destroy ourselves. According to what Tho said, Mary and Joseph made it interdimensionally. Mary could have been a virgin physically, but she made it with Joseph in a way that would allow a soul from a higher reality to come down to earth and have a human experience. Usually this is impossible to do otherwise. Through Yahshua's work, he came here just like us, a total human being, but he went through these three important stages, final death, resurrection, and ascension, and gave us these experiences so that we could access them down the road. Now, as we all know, the story of Jesus has a missing piece. He was a child, disappeared for some time, and then showed up again when he was 30. In a book called The 18 Absent Years of Jesus Christ, the leading theories about where he went was actually out east to either the Himalayan or Tibetan mountains, where he became an enlightened guru. He brought his teachings back to the world after that. If you remember from part one, the Kundalini of the planet was residing in Tibet at that time. They were very spiritually adept people living there and remain so today. Now on the topic of Christ, there's something else I'd like to bring up, the Lord's Prayer. Today, we know this as the only prayer that Jesus taught, but did you know it's actually a geometric prayer meditation? A man named Bodhi McCoy spent over 20 years working with this prayer and analyzing it with sacred geometry and has discovered some incredible synchronicities. In his book, Live the Promise, he explains how the original prayer, not the extended version mind you, has seven segments or thoughts which align perfectly with the seven chakras as well as the seven original branches of yoga. Bodhi teaches how to do this prayer meditation as well as meditations him and his wife have developed based on the Lord's Prayer called Heart Dances. It's really quite incredible to see how it all works with the pure geometries of the universe. If you wish to learn more, check out livethepromise.net. If you study Christian religion and Egyptian religion, you'll actually find that they parallel in almost every way except for the Egyptians' understanding of God. Most evidence shows that Christian religion came out of Egyptian religion, and then later they went back and discredited the Egyptians. Around 300 AD, there was a council called the Council of Nicaea, which was the syndication between the Roman political and religious authorities. Basically, the religious leaders and political leaders realized that they could unite and impose more influence on the people and control society through their unity. It's right around this time that we begin to see the manifestation of the New Testament, which was put together from scriptures and stories, some newer and some much older, which were renewed and superimposed on the life of Yahshua ben Hur, which today we know as Jesus of Nazareth. The term Christ actually stems back from much before the Bible. It comes from the word Christala, which is a word that derives from the original seven core audible sounds of creation. When the creation of the universe occurred, the original tones were Ka, Ra, Ya, Sa, Ta, Ha, La. Christla actually was broken down on earth into two words, Christ, which soon became Christ, and Hla, which became Allah, which were broken down and changed through oral tradition. 
The symbol for Atlantis was three rings inside of the other. The inside were the Nacals, the middle ring were called Maya, and the outer ring were the Atlanteans. The Maya's job was communicating the messages from the inner circle out to the regular people of Atlantis. When Atlantis sank, the Maya took their knowledge, a crystal skull with memories of Atlantis and their calendar, and went out to what today is called the Yucatan Peninsula, birthplace of the Mayan civilization. Their calendar is the most advanced, detailed calendar on the planet, and it has its roots in Atlantis. Over the last few hundred years, a group of people have slowly monopolized the entire world into what it is now. Today, there are 13 families that are among the richest families in the world. They have their hands in next to every organization and government and control over 95% of the money. They control our modern world from the very tippy top. Today, we like to call them the Illuminati, except that's not really who they are. The word Illuminati means enlightened ones, which was established long ago as a secret society that was focused around expanding knowledge through scientific and spiritual understandings. Secret societies were not originally bad, but rather consisted of those who just kind of got it. They understood information that the average person at that time would not accept and demonize. These societies had to be kept a secret because of the control that the church had and refuted the gains what they wanted to explore. This is where Freemasonry originally comes from. If you do the research on the time periods, what probably happened was that the church, who had the majority of the control at the time, probably infiltrated some of these organizations to make sure that they were not creating plans to expose information and destroy the world order that they had created. This led to the church exposing some of the societies as devil worship and blasphemous, and fear of these groups rose. Over time, many secret societies branched off by those who were corrupt or previously infiltrated by the church and gained more control through the church and large organizations that were being established. Today, there exist 13 families around the world who pretty much own the world with over 95% of the money and a lust for greed, power, and control. More and more information has become present lately that many of these families may have DNA that is different than the rest of the human population. It is speculated that they share DNA that was passed down from the Martian race or other species races. They contain no love or emotion and are completely power driven. This brings us to the end of the human history story for spirit science, but of course, it's not really the end. For one, we've only really scratched the surface of discussing many of these topics. Secret societies, for example, would take another two or three lessons to really get into. Plus, the human history story won't end because we're still living it, and what happens next is ultimately up to you. This story, while seemingly unbelievable and at times outrageous, does explain a lot. Think about it. We've covered the Bermuda Triangle, the face on Mars, Jesus, what the Egyptians were doing, the rise of Greece, pretty much most modern religions, the reason we popped up out of nowhere 6,500 years ago, the stair-step evolution of those cultures, and the story of Atlantis, which has been elusive to us at the best of times. It also explains the Great Pyramids and their connection to all of the sacred sites on the planet, the Sumerian tablets, the Emerald tablets, Lucifer, and as for the Hebrews, if you read their Talmud, it actually seems to suggest that they're not from here. I'm not going to tell you to believe it, but it definitely puts some perspective on many questions and aspects about the world which we generally just don't have conclusive answers to. Take it with a grain of salt though. After all, it is just a theory.